All right. Is you is or is you ain't ready? As ready. Here we go. We'll do it live. Okay. We'll, no. we'll do it live. Fuck it. Do it live. I can. I'll write it and we'll do it live. Hello, this is Dublin Moore and Nima Mujur of Irita TV coming to you today. We're doing it live! <clears throat> Excuse me. It's December 27th, 2022. We're near the end of the year. And today we wanted to talk about something that I think everybody's going to find fascinating, which is the spontaneous death of globalism. How could that be the case, you say? Well... If you've listened to the show for any amount of time, or if you haven't, we recommend going back and listening to our critique of the evolution of civilizations. You'll know that we are big fans of a man by the name of Carol Quigley and his writings. And unfortunately for us, Carol Quigley died in like the 70s, and his most recent books are from the 60s. And so he gives these very colorful details and interpretations of all sorts of things going on on Earth, and then suddenly at, like, 1968, which is the most recent book that I have from him, he's gone. And so <laughs> we've actually had several conversations on the show of trying to interpret forward, kind of using the Quigley-esque mindset of, like, what's going on today? And <clears throat> Nima somewhat recently actually discovered a guy and then shared it over to me that I'm, I'm not saying he's like the, the reincarnation of Quigley or something, but he's kind of filling that role that me and Nima have been looking for. So Nima's holding up one of his books. So this is Peter Zahan, and Zahan is spelled Z-E-I-H-A-N, and the book is, uh, the what was it, The End of the World is Just the Beginning? Correct, yeah. <clears throat> so... Uh, if this is brand new information to you, get ready for a wild ride. So Nima's been reading the book, and I've been watching all sorts of this guy's talks. Apparently, Peter Zahan is a, uh, I mean, he. I think he refers to himself as a gister, where basically he accumulates data from every source, and then people um, hire him out for consulting to, to tell them what's going on, on on the world. And because his, his unique capacity is that, he considers himself a generalist, which is to say he doesn't focus on any specific thing and he doesn't fall in love with any specific set of data. He just says, here's the big deal. And the big the, the big thing that he crosses over is um, geopolitics and demographics. Does that sound boring? Yes, but it's about to get really exciting. So, uh, Nima, where do you think is the best way to open open this. I think it's uh, a description of globalism as we're going to be describing it here. It's going to be a little bit different from the uh, 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 conspiracy theory tinfoil hat version of globalism that we're, we're normally talking about. But uh, uh, what globalism is, how it really started, and why it's about to get flushed down the toilet. Do you think that's a good mm -hmm. good, good place to start? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> maybe some... Uh... I don't know if we can tie in some Quigley and real big picture. I think we can. And, and then where does this fall in? Go for it. Well, um, so the big picture, the Quigley's big picture from evolution of civilizations is uh, every civilization goes through seven phases. And those phases are um, uh, mixture, gestation, expansion conflict um universal empire universal empire decay and invasion so i just counted on my hands that was seven i i, I memorized all of them <laughs> uh, um so he analyzes dozens i i, I think a dozen or more of civilizations throughout history to test his theory and it checks out pretty good. And his main topic, obviously, in uh, Tragedy and Hope uh, ends up being Western civilization. But the methodology he applies to analyze Western civilization is from the evolution of civilizations, which is rarely ever discussed. That, that Everyone always talks about the Anglo-American establishment, Tragedy and Hope, 
but I haven't really seen a lot of interest for the actual methodology behind those two books. Right, which and, I think is much more fascinating. I mean, that's the most fascinating yeah. part of the whole thing. Well, right, right. It's like um, it, it gives you the manual and now it's, oh, that's what you're doing. You know, so when you read Tragedy and Hope, you say, oh, that's what you're doing there. You're right. going through that methodology. You didn't tell me. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't really... He doesn't really go into the method in tragedy and hope very much. Uh, he just kind goes of assumes into you know it. it. Right, right, right. But so the big picture of that method is that civilizations have gone through these phases. After phase three, which is conflict, there's an opportunity. Sorry, uh, phase four, which is conflict. There's an opportunity to resume expansion, or you end up moving forward into a universal empire, and then from there on, it, there's no going back from decay and ultimate invasion of, of your country or of your civilization. Mm -hmm. So Western civilization is the... So the mixture of Western civilization begins sometime in 400... Starting 468 yeah. AD. Yeah. When uh, Rome, uh, Western Rome gets sacked and Europe is splintered into a bunch of fiefdoms and kingdoms and... Uh, Archdoms and dukedoms, or whatever these things are. Well, archdom, dukedoms, oh. and on the same time, bishoprics and and abbeys mm -hmm. and monasteries and this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, right. So then, uh, <clears throat> the mixture of different cultures, in particular German, Italian, and French. Um, uh, the, the the German a uh, uh, part of which they've never really been exposed to the sphere of Rome, uh, as much as the, obviously the Italians and the French. But these cultures start to mix and mingle, and that's the beginning of Western civilization. And um, the uh, the mixture begins in, I guess, 460. Uh, it goes into gestation, uh, which basically means there's a, the groundwork is laid for people to work together on expanding your civilization. Well, and, and, and then I think also creating the new culture. Right, because we had the old culture in Rome, which was you know the Roman gods and the, and the structure that they had, and then we had the, the Germanic tribes of the north, and the, and it, I mean the French are kind of also Germanic tribes of the north in, in, at this point in time, right? And then they mix together. We've got a new religion. Um, the old military structure doesn't work anymore. The old economic structure doesn't work anymore. The old intellectual structure doesn't. I, I, all these structures don't work anymore. And so you've got the old Roman one mixing with the, the, the new Germanic one, and the gestation period is, okay, this, this is turning into something concrete. Mm -hmm. This is turning into something new. Yeah. And, and so um, Quigley's definition of a civilization is a producing society with an instrument of expansion. This instrument of expansion starts manifesting in phase three, which is the phase of expansion. So, what does this mean? I guess, I guess we should probably go also go into um, the different spheres of culture that Quigley uh, identifies, which are basically any society sets up institutions or rather instruments to solve problems, and these instruments can fall within uh, six general gradations or, or areas which is going from more concrete to less concrete military political economic social ecclesiastical or religious intellectual. yeah religious yeah, yeah and intellectual so also interesting these are basically <clears throat> these are the six categories for, that try to satisfy our needs in in the world i guess it's the six uh, industries or areas or of interest that people have some kind of desire to to yeah, learn the, more the about need for utilize. security the need for organization the need for wealth the need for for psychological certainty yeah, right all these sorts of things yes right so we have military the need for security politics the need for um i'd say organization yeah organization yeah, yeah. I, Clarity on the interpersonal power relationships. Um, economics is who gets what. The need for stuff. material goods, yes. Mm -hmm. Social is the need for companionship. Um, and then uh, uh, religious is the understanding of the, what's 
where well, are we going? Where did we come Quigley from? Quigley says the need for psychological certainty. Psychological certainty. And six, intellectual, which is science, basically, the pursuit of knowledge in the natural, of knowledge about the natural world. And um, so, and, and, you know, a military could be, as obviously, like a soldier or a, a garrison is part of the military uh, uh, sphere, and um, a government is part of the political sphere. And um, a priesthood a is part of the religious sphere. Yeah, priest, priest is religious. So, w when a society is a producing society, th that means that you know they're still they're uh, they may be growing food. Um, but they just consume all that food that's grown. So they're basically treading water. They're not growing. So um, a, a, a producing society becomes a civilization when they implement an instrument of expansion. And what's an instrument of expansion require? It requires three things. Uh, a savings, investment... Uh, no, surplus was the first one. Yeah, surplus... Um, invention and investment um so what is what do we mean by surplus we mean that for example we produce more food than we can all eat so some of the food is available to um save and be invested feed, yeah to feed people who can work on some machinery or some ox cart that's better or some things that make your output per they, worker they can invest greater. in infrastructure or capital yeah to put it in modern yeah. terms yes yeah so um i, I just always get a little uh, uh, uh you know geek out on this because <laughs> uh <laughs> Me too. so the the save the, the important aspect of the savings is in, in my opinion it's really that you have a group of people that has stuff that some other group of people wants and doesn't have because otherwise how do you excite someone to join your investment pro your oh i want to build a machinery and uh, i want to build a well i want to build a road but what, what well, do they get out of it well let's give well, some con you... concrete examples of that i mean i mean let's mm -hmm. go back to the sumerian priesthood right as quigley describes it and you know i i don't know if new data has been found out since the 60s on how exactly the sumerian priesthood worked but as chris quigley described it the priesthood gets a monopoly on the knowledge of when the floods are going to come from the tigris and euphrates rivers so they're able to warn people to say hey you got you got to get out of the delta before it floods and it kills you all instead of telling everybody how that works they occult and keep the knowledge to themselves <laughs> and they say oh we're talking with the gods in order to figure it out when in reality they, they just had a mathematical formula that averaged each year to get to get a more and more accurate picture and they said okay you people need to give us offerings so we can communicate to the gods so we can tell you when the, the floods are going to occur, right? And then as the people brought the offerings, the, the priesthood is able to accumulate the surplus, presumably of food, probably, right? But I'm sure there's tools and... and, and gold, I mean, they gave offerings in gold. Okay. Uh, also. What, 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 whatever was the thing that was needed, then they, because the, the priesthood has the surplus they could turn around and say you know what let's utilize this surplus to pay people to build irrigation for example uh, we just got right. a question the various stages of the methods are organized in a specific order i assume it must follow a specific pattern he's asking are um, um uh this is a uh, zamorano uh, are yeah. you referring to the seven stages of civilization or are you referring to the um We'll call it the gamut of the way that society is is broken up. When, yeah. when uh, Nemo was Those saying, like different. the political, the, the military, and, and and so forth. Right. The the the, the um, culture analysis is the latter of what you were just pointing out. It's basically observing a given society at this moment. So a any given moment, society will be engaging in these six spheres. And, and and through time they will march so the latter um what well, uh, no uh, they, i'm sorry Nima, go first i do have something to say on it well the, the 
it, it doesn't have to be organized in a specific order. Sometimes these things spring into existence out of necessity. For example, you have a tribe that's unarmed and your tribe gets attacked by an armed tribe. Now you realize, oh my God, we have to have these weapons. So we have to create a military to protect our tribe. Well, and then, so then spring into existence springs an instrument of self-defense which is a tribal military, I guess, in this case. Sorry, well, and then uh, Quigley even points out, uh, or he, he, he has these charts. Um, Nima, do you have tragedy and hope within when reaching distance? I have it over there, yeah. but I got to get up. So um, near the beginning, when, when he's kind of breaking down these ideas, yeah, the tome, <laughs> uh, he'll, he'll actually rate a civilization on a given time, and these are all approximate, to say, okay, on each of these six things that he has arbitrarily divided it into he does emphasize this that these divisions are completely arbitrary where we could we could group them more or we can cut them up into more detail as we need and for the sake of of how he's doing his analysis he was comfortable using these six different divisions but right. uh, when you look at these six the, the, divisions and put it on a chart you can say okay how developed is a particular civilization in a, at a particular time in each of these six divisions and I mean, uh, I think he ha at some point there he's got like a, a modern Western civilization, for example, were super developed intellectually. Is that it right there? But that's what I'm asking you. Is that what you're referring to? No, that looks like the demographic graph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a demographic site. Um. Uh, for example, we're very, very de developed intellectually, like on the scientific level, but we're very, very backwards right now on on the religious level. Right, because yeah. I mean, we're all fucking nihilists and, and atheists at this point. Yeah, which is, it, right, but, right. I, but and then go back a thousand years, maybe we're backward intellectually, but we're we're way up on the religious level because you know everybody's Catholic or, or yeah. whatever, right? So yeah, I think that answer this question is he said, okay, that was his exactly my doubt. It's adaptable. Yeah, it's um, it's not. There's no. Uh, there's no CEO of the six divisions of society that ordains how society exactly be structured in most cases obviously you know you may have some uh, really command uh, top-down societies where it's all planned but generally speaking these things emerge in the course of the development of civilizations out of necessity out of out of need this is what people these are the things that people want right uh, safety oh my god I'm scared I want safety um, who has power over me? Politics. I want stuff, material. I want friends and, and love, the social companionship. These are basically the things. I also, I think these are, I would call them the um, nodes of, or the, the spheres of power, because these are things that people will grab a hold of to have power over society. To be able to offer something that they want and that they need, you know, so it becomes conditional then in some right. cases. Well, and then I guess, that, I give you... you know, either it can spontaneously arise or we, we uh, identify, oh, hey, we're lacking in this thing. And yeah. now and that we understand this, we can consciously do something about right. it. Right, right. Yeah. So, so, so it, right. So these things come spring into existence as instruments, as Carol Quigley called them. So we have... Um, um, a spontaneous military that's an instrument it's there to defend you but these instruments through time turn into institutions and what he means by that is the group uh, the organization starts serving its own aggrandizement and its own personal individual goals rather than the originally stated goals right so you start going from a military that defends you from attackers to a military that has to have permanent standing armies and drills and rituals and the and make, horses need to be fed. And making sure that the soldiers get paid and making sure that you impress politicians. And then we can go one step further to say, hey, we got to make sure that we're constantly at war. There's no reason to keep a standing army and have a, you know, right. blah, 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 that sort of thing. Right, right. Yeah. So in this case, so this example also, for example, the instrument turns against its own purpose, right? Because people are supposed to be safe. But now the army wants to make war in order to retain its relevance and aggrandize its position. And um, yeah, he says perfect example and realistic because it seems happens <laughs> to uh, be happening all the time. Well, so these th things happen with every uh, 
instrument that pops uh, up. Every social organization. In, uh, I every want social em- organization. Yeah, I want to emphasize so gave- this, is that, uh, that Quigley points out that there's a natural reason for this happening. And if I remember that off the top of my head, the first one is that within an organization, if an organization has a purpose, we'll stick with the army. The purpose of the army is to provide security and protect the nation. So there's, the first reason that uh, institutionalization happens is that there's no person, singular person in the army, whose job it is to achieve the goal. Their job is to make sure these guys get fed or to um, move vehicles around or to um, – oh, that didn't work at all. Damn it. Okay. Or to um, – sorry, I, I got – I set something up to work really fancy and it just didn't work and I'm kind of kicking myself for it and trying to <laughs> keep up midstream here. So, um, yeah, everybody has an individual job. And none of them is make sure that the goal of the organization continues to be the goal of the organization. Secondarily, everybody within that organization, they are naturally looking out for their own self-interest. They want promotions. They want um, you know higher pay and that sort of thing. So they're going to make decisions not on the goal of the organization, but largely within their own self-interest. Third, and, and this is kind of the, the thing that the big one, is that once the there there's inertia once there's momentum behind the social organization there becomes a group that controls that social social organization that becomes in quotes a vested interest and that vested interest likes the status quo and the way that everything is set up because obviously yeah. they benefit from it so they become resistive to changing anything about what's going on because yeah. that would take you know, take the resources away from themselves. Yep. Yes. So what he's saying here is their own existence becomes bigger than their purpose. Exactly. Oh, that's a great way to put it. He always puts things in such a great way. Um, so now his argument here, and th- th- that description right there that we just gave, if you want to switch us back to video, um, that description that we just gave, spe- um, he says... Just real quick, uh, just real quick, this book is actually a pretty quick read. You yeah, know, so people like might think, pages. Yeah. Oh my God, it's another tragedy and hope, but no, it's absolutely not. It's like a very quick read. And yeah, it, maybe it has 400 pages, but it it's like much larger letters. It's much larger letters and smaller pages <laughs> than, than tragedy and hope. That's right. Um, what the, the, the central premise behind Quigley, what, what, basically what he's doing, Quigley... Uh, was a biochemist major for like three years before he switched over to history. And his whole idea is, how do I apply scientific principles to history? And this is his his scientific principle, or at least his, his hypothesis, is that all social organizations have a natural tendency to institutionalize and that this is a natural process and is 100% predictable. Right. And so when he says so- tragedy and hope in his book, the tragedy... Is that this is a you know this is the way that things go, but the hope is that this is not deterministic. If we could identify it and say, hey, this is what's going on, we can change it. Yeah. So w- we just went through an example uh, of a military organ uh, instrument, right? So then there's uh, social instruments. There's all kinds of instruments, but one instrument that's critical, or one one type of instrument that's critical to civilization. To a civilization, according to Quigley, it's the instrument of expansion. Right. This is a defining feature of a yeah, civilization. So yeah. There's, there's military this that, but the defining instrument is the instrument of expansion, uh, without which there is no civilization. And what is the instrument of expansion? Well, we just explained. There has to be a surplus accumulation. There has to be invention, and there has to be investment. And the surplus accumulation just means that some people have more than others, so they and, and, can... and they have more than their ine- immediate needs. And, and more yes. than they need to consume, so they can hire people into areas where that that do not fulfill immediate consumption needs, such as building new machinery, new devices, etc. In today's world, obviously, computer software uh, and all that stuff. And, and so then, then obviously, there has to be people who choose to take that surplus and put use it, it usefully, use invest, yes, invest it. And then there has to be. Um, and research and development, I guess we would call it today, but there has to be inventiveness. There has to be the idea to do something to begin with, because without that, that there's no investment. Um, 
and even if I wanted to invest, even if nobody wanted to work, then you know I don't have a surplus. I can't build the invention. So right. some. So this is also interesting. It kind of gives you uh, the um, the. I mean, it gives you the insight that capitalism requires a, a constant mismatch in people's wealth. There always has to be people struggling to obtain something. <laughs> Seems to work like a virus. He says. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so, um, well, so that's the instrument of expansion broadly. Well, and, and, then, and then let's talk about the institutionalization of that instrument broadly. Well, so, right. So, so this is what I was just getting to. So we okay. just explained how instruments become institutionalized over time. And that same thing applies to the instrument of expansion. So actually we should probably go through some examples of instruments of expansion well, I mean, let's history. go with the same sumerian <laughs> example that, that i started off with so, right so sumerian yeah. the instrument of expansion was um, uh, in the religious realm in this six fold uh, a gradient of culture the priesthood accumulated the surpluses and started uh, 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 deploying the surpluses to hire people to build, you know, bridges, roads, dams, whatever. In infrastructure that the entire society benefits from. Right, right. Well, theoretically, I mean, there's and, slaves and stuff, but I mean, you get the picture. Right. Yeah. Right. So in um, Western civilization, the the instrument of expansion was initially feudalism and then it turned to capitalism all the way through today but it went through successive different stages of capitalism which we uh, will get into well, I mean, well, we, we'll but get let's, into let's talk about the institutionalization and in, in sumeria first so so that was the okay. instrument of expansion what did it look like once it institutionalized oh okay i'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take it <laughs> is um so I, at first the, the priesthood is collecting the surplus what whether nefarious or immoral means or not doesn't matter for the sake of this conversation. And then they reinvest it into public works that the entire society can benefit from and therefore become more wealthier and therefore expand. This is, this is the, the, where the age of expansion comes in, into play. When, when the instrument becomes institutionalized, that, that um, organization, in this case the religious organization, once it accumulates a surplus, instead of spending it on things that benefit the society, they spend it on themselves. We're going to build ziggurats. We're going to have crazy parties. We're going to have 40 slaves each. We're, you know, All this stuff on personal aggrandizement instead of purveying it into into the society. And what happens is, once the, the speed of growth of the society starts to slow down, this is officially when Carol Quigley says we enter the age of conflict because the instrument of expansion is no longer serving the people. And what's in, what's interesting here, however, is the people are still paying for it, right? So the people are still paying for, for this instrument of expansion. I mean, the uh, uh, easy way to think of this is, you know, you pay your taxes, they build roads, and then suddenly, they're not, you know, they're not building roads anymore. They're absconding with the taxes somewhere else, and you're going, well, I, well I'm still paying for it, right? Um so as as more and more resources get eaten up for personal aggrandizement instead of what the people had had originally expected it to pay for, society, the civilization, typically deals with this by going to war. This is where the age of conflict comes in. They can say, okay, we, we can get resources by stealing it from our neighbors, and and we can you know hire all these people that suddenly don't have the resources that they need. Where where a you know we can give them a job, and b we can hopefully kill some of them, <laughs> so so we don't have to we don't have to feed them anymore. And this is how we start marching down the the stages of civilization. And the the um, uh, again Quigley's argument, <laughs> yeah, Quigley's argument that um, an instrument will naturally institutionalize. This is what it looks like when it uh, apply, applies to the most important instrument of a civilization, which is the instrument of expansion. Right. So you just gave the example of the priesthood in Sumeria. Then other civilizations uh, started using different instruments within culture to accumulate surpluses. Uh, in the feudal era, it was the... Um, the knights with the, the, the self-sufficient manners, right? They, they would accumulate mm -hmm. a surplus from their serfs. And then exactly. uh, they were able to trade luxury goods with their – utilizing their accumulated surpluses. Mm -hmm. That came later on. So, um, so, 
so we have this insert expansion today it's the uh, it's um financial capitalism uh, by the way uh, or as i would actually call it um, almost i think turning into full on data capitalism but we just stick with financial this, capitalism this is another conversation we've had before yes um expansion is inevitable therefore all that comes with it right so um, so j just to move things along here because we're trying to get to peter zahan <laughs> right. so um all civilizations have followed this graph that um uh quigley has described with two exceptions the first one is the hittites that they were somewhere in in, in the phase of stage uh, somewhere in stage three and they suddenly vanish off the face of the earth and it's a great mystery for history students because they can't figure out why because the, yeah, the sea peoples um the second is western civilization and we have the opposite situation where each time that we have gone into the conflict zone and we're on the verge of universal empire a new instrument of expansion be gets developed which makes the old one irrelevant and uh, a, a, a new age of expansion can start. And so um, if, you've, if you've got – I can never remember the guy who was the first universal – attempt at first universal empire in Western civilization. Was it Charlemagne or Clovis? Um, what what, what, so what are the, these guys the, in like the 12th century? The first universal empire – would have been under the Brits and in, in, uh, under feudalism. Right. Uh, uh, I, I can't um, remember the name of the king that attempted it. So basically, yeah, well, it wouldn't be Charlemagne. It would be, like be a British king, Charles. Oh yeah, Charlemagne was a was a Ro Holy Roman Emperor, right? Yeah, I, I, sorry, right. I can't. So can't Charlemagne remember. falls in this period of um, gestation, and um, when the expansion begins, he's out. I think basically Charlemagne was. A, Actually, the Holy Roman Empire and all this right. stuff. Wh whoever it was that I can't remember the <laughs> name of. William the Conqueror. I think that was it. There's my C, Conqueror. <laughs> yeah. um, so William the Conqueror attempts to, to universal empiralize the feudal system. However, in the meantime, a new instrument of expansion was formed, which quickly refers to as commercial capitalism, if I remember correctly, which if mm -hmm. if... I think the rough detail is that people have better naval capacity and can start trading by boat. So, the, so basically, okay, uh, uh, William the Conqueror, you just won the uh, uh, the the War of Swords. We just invented muskets. So, have fun with that. Is basically what happened. And then, as this develops, the next attempt at universal empire was actually Napoleon. And I, I mean. When you look at him conquering the map, it looks like he almost got it. But what happened in in England is the Industrial Revolution started. So, <laughs> it, basically, that's saying, okay, Napoleon, you just won the War of Muskets. Great, we just invented machine guns. Not literally at this point, but um, what, what you know, we we have uh, industrial um, revolution capacity where we, we could pump stuff out faster than you could deal with anything in in your system. And so then um, the uh, Society becomes industrialized. We have a new age of expansion. This culminates with Hitler almost getting, at least according, according to Quickly, attempting to um, do a universal empire. He loses, and then this is where we started the conversation when we go, okay, um, he loses in 1945. 20 years later, yeah. Quigley writes his last book or that we have access to in 1968, which isn't a whole lot of time to figure out what's going on. Now where are we at? Right. And um, so we went from feudalism through commercial capitalism to industrial capitalism in the 1700s and 1800s to monopoly capitalism in the early 1900s. Uh, actually, you skipped one. Sorry, to, to financial capitalism and then monopoly capitalism in the early 1900s. And then we have World War uh, Two, and now we're here. And what's the system we're under now? Quickly calls it the pluralist society. But he never gives and, a really clear description of what that means. Right. And um, Peter Zehan picks up there, so I think it's a nice segue yeah. to, uh, uh, to his What Why don't switch, switch us back to, to video? So... Peter Zahan starts his story, 
at least as I understand it, that at the end of World War II, the U.S. was basically the last man standing in any sort of industrial capacity. And we had this new specter on the horizon of the Soviet Union. And the U.S. made a deal that's kind of unique in history, which is to say, hey, we're the last power here, particularly we're, we're the last power that has any sort of naval projection. Hey, rest of the world, we'll make you a deal. We will agree to patrol the oceans of the world if you agree to let us set your foreign policy so we can contain the Soviet Union. And this starts the... Um, the history of globalism, or this starts the, the, the trajectory of globalism, which is to say the whole world being able to trade with each other safely, right? Because before this, um, if you had your boat in the wrong spot trying to trade, uh, I mean, a, a, a neighboring country could just take it. And there, the, there wasn't a whole lot you could do about it other than like going to war. And so now that the, the U.S. is the last man standing, it's the only place that has any sort of uh, of naval project, projection, it can say, okay, we can protect the entire world's oceans and control the whole world's oceans so you guys can trade. And uh, Peter Zahan even makes an interesting note here is he's like, you know, people refer to the American empire. This isn't really an empire in traditional terms. In traditional terms, if we look at, say, the British empire, they had the naval projection to benefit Britain. Whereas... Um, the, the goal of the U.S. naval projection isn't economic. It's um, political and military, which is to contain the Soviet Union. And what happens is we, we create a system on the, wor in the, on the world stage where suddenly certain areas of the world that aren't really capable of being self-sufficient say, places in the Middle East or places in Africa or whatever, but they do have access to, say, one raw resource like oil or wood or gold or diamonds, something like this, right, is they can now import everything that they need from the rest of the world as long as they're able to export this one raw resource. And the only reason that they're able to do this is because the United States is patrolling the world's oceans and keeping them safe. Now, fast forward to, what, 1991 or whatever it is. Soviet Union is not a thing anymore. And the United States, the people of the United States, are really getting sick of the idea of, of patrolling the oceans of the world. And since then, we've been phasing out our foreign policy, particularly under Trump. Um, and uh, according to P Peter Zahan, uh, Biden is just doubling down on this, on this foreign policy. Um, that, okay, we're not interested in patrolling the oceans anymore, so instead of having a navy that, that can uh, we can project with, like, say, 800 destroyers, uh, I think Peter Zahan said in order for us to patrol the oceans, we would need 800 destroyers. We have focused more on aircraft carriers, which are great for um, military conquest and military defense. I mean, you, you, you could knock a country out with aircraft carriers, but you can't patrol the oceans because they can't be everywhere at once. So we're, we're in this phase where now that the, the, the United States is backing off from patrolling the oceans, we're looking at a pre-World War II situation where, okay, there's regional blocks and maybe one country looks at another country and says, I'm going to steal the stuff on your boat. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? And now what are the consequences of this? Well, um, Let's fold that over with demographics. So we, we just kind of talked about the, the a really rough geopolitical situation, right? Let's fold that over with demographics. So after World War II, we've, we've got the baby boomer generation that more or less happened everywhere on Earth. There's exceptions, but more or less happened everywhere on Earth where we have this huge population bubble. Which is uh, 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 due to industrialization, according to Zehan. I mean, I, I'm reading his book now and he goes into a little more detail he talks about how the phenomenon of industrialization in the 1700s 1800s and the urbanization has increased lifespans and when you when you increase the lifespan of the population through better hygiene all these things then you're going to have population growth i mean your population is gonna 
be it's going to get bigger because there's more people not dying uh, yeah there's more people not, not dying. dying yes <laughs> so um then there's also there's a phase where those people still have sufficient children but as urbanization moves on these people who live longer now have fewer children so now you have a situation where you have population looks like it's growing and growing and growing but at the same time, the people who are supposed to have children have fewer and fewer children. So there's going to come a hard cut at one point where now these children that could have been born throughout all this period where it looked like civilized population was growing, they haven't been born. And the older generation is retiring. And now we, we don't have enough uh, young people in most places in the world. So that that's the demographic scenario that he talks about which is a nece by necessity a phenomenon of industrialization well and then he also argues that this is happening right <clears throat> now like, well, like the, the, the the apex of of the boomer bubble moving through where, where we're going to have more retirees yeah. than than boomers working is happening right this second <laughs> this year or the last year or so where the majority of boomers have gone into retirement and what comes with that is worker shortages because most p countries in the world don't have enough millennials don't have enough gen zers the u.s uh, ironically also, does well the, the u.s than, yeah go ahead the u.s is much better off than these other countries according to zehan uh demographically i mean in almost every uh, in almost every dimension of geopolitics and culture the U.S. is better off than the rest of the world at this very moment, because as the the, the world is going to start fragmenting again, and the U.S. has already started with the Trump administration in the 20 teens, has begun reindustrializing, according to Zehan, heavily actually. Well, and, and before, this is going to be a trend. I was going to say before we talk about that, I think it's worth because. Um, this I think this is a new way of thinking for a lot of people. I think we should go over uh, roughly the U.S. like you're doing now, uh, Russia and China and possibly Germany as the, the the big players on Earth that are about to view very very rapid change, and only one of those four looks good. <laughs> Um, the U.S. is the only one that looks good. So we're here. Yeah. Well, and, and we'll, we'll talk about maybe that. two. Actually, maybe two. By the way. What's the second one? He, he's like he says Russia could. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, he says Russia could have an opportunity, um, but yeah. Anyway, well, let, let's start. Let, let's start with Russia. Germany. We got, we got the whole Ukraine war thing going on, right? So, Russia. If you if you look at their po population bubble, so as Nima was mentioning, uh, in the United States, even though there's more Boomers and Millennials and Gen Z. There still are a lot of millennials. The boomers here did have significant numbers of children. In most of the other countries on Earth, they didn't. They didn't. And so right. when you look at something like Russia, when you, when you look at the population profile of Russia, it looks like we're, we're moving through this boomer bubble. And one of the reasons that Peter Zahan claims that the Ukraine war is happening right now is because this is literally the last chance where there's enough fighting age males in Russia that they could actually have a war because after this, there literally won't be enough people in the country to have an army to fight a war. <laughs> and so that's problem number one with Russia is they, ha they, they have this demographic time bomb that's happening in real time right now. The second problem is um, Russia's kind of a glorified gas station where the, the, their biggest export that they have, the biggest thing that they have going for them is oil and natural gas. And that if um, a large part of that oil and natural gas comes from areas that are in permafrost. So when um, Russia is invading the Ukraine, and it's doing so for for for, for uh, geopolitical reasons. Sorry, well, I'll get back to oil in a second. It's doing so for geopolitical reasons where uh, Russia sees this as a matter of life and death. And according to Peter Zahan, they're not really wrong about that because Russia's so flat, it's pretty indefensible. And um, historically, the way Russia has done uh, has dealt with it is that they've expanded to choke points. Uh, 
Whether that you know that's that that's the um, you know Georgia and Armenia where you where you have the little straight in between the two uh, two um, seas or the, you know the, the mountains in Eastern Europe or whatever, the right? It, is 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 you you expand to these choke points where if if there was an invasion that were to come, you could you could stop it. Now pre Soviet Union, they had all these choke points either directly in the Soviet Union or in the buffer fringe. Of the of the Eastern European countries that were technically their own countries, but really had to do what the Soviet Union told them to do, right? Um, they lost all that, and Putin, okay, again, according to Peter Zahan, this is one of his biggest worries: is getting that space back. And not only do they need to get that space back, when they look at something like the Ukraine, Russia literally needs the people in the Ukraine. It, it like because they've got this population time bomb, demographic time bomb that's going off right now. They literally need the population <laughs> in the Ukraine. And Peter Zahan has further pointed this out: is that none of the choke points that I just described are in the Ukraine. They're beyond the Ukraine. So um, it's it's complete. A he he completely predicted that the the Ukraine invasion was going to happen. And B his next prediction is they're not going to stop. Because I, I believe Moldova has one of the choke points, and uh, you know some Latvia or whatever the, the other choke points there. And what acor- again, according to Peter, well, it's Zahan, interesting because uh, Moldova also has its uh, its own little Russian republic. Oh yeah, um, that is rarely talked about Transnistria. But well, uh, they can they theoretically do the same 80. thing. Russia could do the same thing of like, oh, yeah. look at this independent can, country of Russians. Yeah. Yes. Right, right. <laughs> they could do the same model. But this is um, the, uh, a map here. Uh, I, I think Peter Zehan used this map also, which I, I don't know if it's a good illustration, but it kind of, give, first of all, it gives you a sense of how much arable land is there really in, in Russia. It's not a and lot. It's, uh, yeah. Um, or I should say and- it is a lot, but it's spread out in a way that makes it really difficult to access. Well, right. Yes. In, I mean, I also I don't really know how, <laughs> like, what, what kind of climates are we talking about in, in these? Uh, oh, right, right. Uh, uh, the, that's touching here. the Arctic Ocean. Yes. Right. <laughs> but um, so so if you look at Ukraine, it's all green. It's like if you if you think you, Russia is this giant country and Ukraine is this small little country, why are the Russians so interested in it? Well, if you look at it in terms of uh, uh, arable land, I mean. All of Ukraine is green, so it's all part of the Russian wheat belt, and it's a significant chunk of it. I mean, it's maybe like a, a fifth or a fourth of all of what Russia. Uh, and it's not has. In, it's not in a tundra zone, <laughs> right? Right. And then also, what what is important about Ukraine uh, geopolitically uh, is the fact that if Ukraine is handed over to NATO. There's, this is all step, this easily invaded, basically. Right. From the, the, the the, the, it's this. impossible to have a choke point at that point if Ukraine Right. Whereas goes here, into you have to protect this... Uh, um, choke points. What's it? Uh, the, the choke, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, they're mountain ranges or whatever. They, they have, like, one road that comes through them or something like that. Right. Right. Um, and you can talk about gaps here. So I guess Polish Gap, Baltic Sea, Bessarabian Gap... So I guess these are points where uh, people could still come in, but they're they, obviously they want to keep those small, right? You know, right. So here is another fascinating thing. So apparently Russia invades the Ukraine, and they bungled it up so badly. They bungled it up so badly that the that the American generals are looking over at them, going, "Russia doesn't know how to fight a modern war." And after, after they shook their heads stunned, they realized, wait a minute, if we get in a ground war with Russia, we're going to kick their asses. And then they went, wait a minute, if, if we're just going to steamroll them, that means the only option Russia has is nukes. And so, again, the, uh, r- repeating Peter, Peter Zahan here, right, is that... One of the reasons that the United States and the West in general is freaking out so hard about the Ukraine is they say if Russia takes the Ukraine and they understand that that's not their stopping point, they're going to keep going. And at some point they go to a 
they they hit a NATO country. Now it's NATO versus Russia on a ground war. NATO recognizes that they're going to steamroll Russia based on what they just saw, and that Russia's only only option out at that point is nukes. They're like. In order for us to avoid a nuclear war, this can't go beyond the Ukraine. Which, when I first heard that, by the way, I was actually kind of shocked because, I was really shocked actually, because I'm like, that's a pretty good reason for supporting the Ukraine. And if that's a pretty good reason for supporting the Ukraine, why are we getting all this crazy fucking propaganda about how you know glorious the Ukraine is and how evil Russia is, and and you're not you're you're not allowed to, to you know you'll you'll get banned off of YouTube or whatever. Uh, I, don't, I don't think they're banned. Well, we're streaming on YouTube. Hopefully, hopefully they don't ban us. Um, but uh, people are getting censored left and right if the, if the, if they questioned Ukraine, uh, the uh, Ukrainian um, moral superiority at the beginning, and which led me to go, okay, well the media is telling me to think this, so I should think the opposite. But now I hear this, and I'm like, actually, you know, that's kind of a reasonable argument. By the way, argument. we need to. Uh, What's that? So uh, we need to replace the. You need to replace the the logo behind you with a Ukraine flag. Oh yeah, around, I'm sorry. So we don't I'm get sorry. booted off yeah, of good, YouTube. Yeah, good, good point. Good point. Yeah. So anyway, um, we'll get to it. We'll get. To, we, we'll get. To it. So so that, that that's kind of the, the the current drama surrounding Ukraine, and it's it's a fresh perspective, and I'm actually kind of frustrated. Yeah, yeah. so that's Russia. Yeah. So, well, I, I do want to add uh, this at the we end. Didn't necessarily, even is yeah. is that I feel like okay. if if our our propaganda network just told us that, <laughs> like they'd get a little bit more support instead of just ramming it down. But anyway, I'm I'm getting sidetracked. Go ahead. That's Russia. Yeah. So that, that's uh, so again. Big picture is because of the demographic decline, uh, because of the demographic situation born out of industrialization. Um, countries are going to have worker shortages, and with that shortages of yeah inflation, and um, uh, and with that they're going to start moving in industry back into their own countries. The U.S. has a head start with that, and all over the world, this is what Zehan ad- identifies as the current trend, and he calls it the end of the order. He keeps on referring to 1945 through 2015 as the order, um, but it's synonymous with globalism, uh, um, post, I guess, part of it was Bretton Woods uh, order, but the big picture is the industry moving back into the big countries of the world. And so we're not outsourcing really, to China, for example. Right. So not outsourcing to countries that could be a security risk. And also, he says in this book that something's going to blow off somewhere in either Russia or the Middle East or in East Asia, and that will lead to the unraveling of this order. And I think that's exactly. And he wrote that before, right before February, uh, the February invasion yeah. of Ukraine the, earlier this year. So it has some good predictive power, what he wrote there. But if that's not what we're seeing right now, I don't know what it is. I mean, the whole world is now going, is freaking out kind of about things that they used to take for granted. And that's exactly the uh, message of Zehan's book and his analysis is nothing is going to be the way it used to be. A lot of things that we took for granted, we're not going to be able to access anymore uh, as this order changes. I do want to add, add, finish one more thing on Russia. Sorry, because I started with oil. I think this is super important. Is that, um, and, and, and this is the dire situation Russia is looking at, is, is the reason I want to point this out, is they have oil that gets drawn up out of a permafrost zone. And due to the fact that it's a permafrost zone, the, the, the flow cannot be stopped. If the flow stops, um, the, uh, the, the oil will coagulate with the water and it will bust the pipes. And, he, and Peter Zahan points out that the last time that this happened is when the Soviet Union fell and people stopped working and the things busted up. And he said it has taken them 30 years to replace it. And that was with the help of Western um, oil industry. 
Now with all these sanctions that are happening all over Russia, what's happening is they're running into a situation where there may not be enough demand for them to continue pumping that oil out. And if it breaks, it's done. And what we're looking at, here's uh, here's a terrifying prediction, right? So all these sanctions have been going on Russia. A new sanction occurs January 1st in, what, four days, five days, is that um, there will be a new sanction on insurance. Western companies will no longer be allowed to insure ships with Russian cargo, which includes Russian oil tankers. And this goes back to uh, the privateering and piracy that I talked about at, earlier, is once that happens... It's going to take one country, and it could be it could be like Latvia or something, to, to go up and go, you know what? This tanker's ours. We're taking everything. And Russia, he pointed out, has the ability to insure, self-insure $5 billion. That's nothing. Wait. Right? He thinks Lat Latvia is going to take a Russian tanker? No, he, sa he said, for example, Latvia could. Wait. No, but I mean, I'm just like... I, because I Latvia has a, has a vendetta. Well, Latvia is pissed off at Russia, and they could do but it knowing that these are going to be the results. Latvia is also absolutely terrified of Russia, so... I would doubt that they would um, go that far. Okay, but who, um, uh, the point wasn't Latvia. The point is whoever it is, it could be a small player like that that could set off the chain of events because mm -hmm. if um, what one of these boats gets ships gets hijacked by anybody mm -hmm. and then the insurance stops, that means the boats don't go out. If the boats stop going out, there's no place to pump the new oil. And if there's no place to pump the new oil, you shut it off, it breaks, and the infrastructure's done. Mm -hmm. And then that, that's the main resource of Russia is being able to pump that oil. So they are in a fucking pickle <laughs> right yeah. now. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. So, no, enough, enough of Russia. Russia. Uh, so, by the way, uh, we have a comment. What I see is the USA crushing Europe and transferring many of the German industry to the USA. Yeah, let's talk well, about Germany. So, we'll get to, to that. Um, oh, he, he said that. Okay. So, I mean, uh, uh, if we want to close it off about Russia, I could... Go, I could just read a quick paragraph yeah, from it. the book where he talks about Russia. While everything in Russia is and always has been done in its own peculiar way, it is undeniable that Russia was part of the first big batch of countries to industrialize, after the Brits and on a similar time frame to the Germans. The intertwined demographic and industrialization stories of the Russians and Germans, in fact, have been the story of Europe from the early 1800s right up to the current day. But whereas the Germans used the American-led order to make a quantum leap up, uh, up the value at its scale and turn their economy from an industrialized one into a more export-oriented ori technocratic structure, <laughs> the Soviet Union was the order's target and so could do none of that. Instead, the Soviets went down the road of command-driven communism. Outside of the military realm, Russia simply could not keep up with the technological dynamism of the American-led world. As the years stacked up into decades, the Soviet economy plateaued in terms of sophistication and nearly all economic growth in the 60s and 70s wasn't from technology or productivity, but instead from an expansion of the working age population. More inputs, more outputs. To believe the Soviet Union would continue to function over the long haul, you had to believe that the Soviet population would continue growing, and that just wasn't in the cards. Between devastation and the world wars, Stalin's tender urbanization and collectivization efforts, broad-scale mismanagement under Khrushchev, and organizational stagnation under Brezhnev, the Soviet Union stopped generating sufficient numbers of new workers. By 1980, the demographic pipeline was already running dry, and then the bottom fell out. The trauma of the Soviet collapse was economic, cultural, political, strategic, and demographic. Between 1986 and 1994, the birth rate halved, while the death rate nearly doubled. <laughs> Russia today is deindustrializing at the same time its population is collapsing. Dark? Yes. But Russia is probably one of the best case scenarios for much of the industrialized world. Russia, after all, at least has ample capacity at home to feed and fuel itself in addition to sufficient nuclear weapons to make any would-be aggressors stop and think. 
a few dozen times before launching an assault. In a world of constrained trade and capital, one could be in significantly more dire straits than still having strategic depth plus reasonably reliable food, fuel and electricity. But the gold standard in terms of preparing for a post-growth life is elsewhere. And then he goes to Japan. Um, just real quick, he says Japan has dealt with a post-growth malaise a phenomenon by desourcing, which means you set up factories abroad and you hire people from abroad and you sell to those people abroad. And the money comes back home, I guess, to support your retirees or whatever. Right. Um, um, so whatever. So Russia uh, still at least has the resources and the military, the, the nukes to um, be some sort of self-sufficient. Um, right. I guess that's all for Russia. As yeah. opposed to uh, Germany. Let's, I think it's a good segue to Germany because what's happening okay. in Russia is really <laughs> affecting Germany right now. Right. So Germany um, is uh, has been for a long time export dependent and uh, needs to export goods to the U.S. and doesn't have the natural resources to be self-sufficient and doesn't have the demographic structure, first and foremost, to be self-sufficient. So uh, Zeyhan's outlook for Germany and China is incredibly dire. Uh, I don't know what exactly it's going to look like or whatever, but he says that they are going to, they are deindustrializing, and this is their last decade, this or the next two decades maybe, their last two decades of them being an industrially relevant uh, country. Well, and then with China. Well, but before we move on to China, I do want to say this about Germany, what's, what's happened recently because of the, the Ukraine war and the sanctions is Peter Zahan has pointed out that the entire basis of the German economy is being able to get cheap natural gas and petroleum from Russia because of, because of their their industry, which is fundamentally a, a you know a chemical, and then um um uh uh what the hell is what I want engineering engineering industry they, they they build a lot of stuff right is all the base resource for that is that natural gas and petroleum. Those are the base chemicals that they make everything else out of. So if the price of that suddenly skyrockets or they can't get access to it, the entire German industrialization network collapses. Now, when you add on to the fact the demographic situation, the baby boomers in Germany did not have kids like they like they did here in the United States. Uh, Germany is, is up a creek without a paddle right now. And to um, uh, that is, uh, by the way, that applies to almost all countries that are not the United States. Their, their boomers didn't have as many children as the U.S. did because the U.S. was after the war, everything was in rubble, and the U.S. was you know, stand standing. Yeah, they didn't have bombs falling on their cities, etc. So yeah, that's why. And uh, to to the point of the of the viewer here, uh, Zamorano, that he he sees the industrialization coming here instead of Germany. Well, here instead of Germany and instead of China, which we're going to get into. But as Nima has been pointed at, has pointed out, what f something like five years ago or so now, the U.S. has recognized this and has actually started reindustrializing here. Yeah. So yes, com completely agree. Nima, China. Yes, yeah, so which is China bleak. Very yes. bleak. Yes. China is bonkers because they now apparently they may well have the lowest growth rate ever recorded anywhere in terms of uh, reproduction rates, like one point three. Or no, it's worse per... than that. So, are you getting that from the book? Because maybe worse than well, that. P Peter Zahan when he's doing his talks. That's from the book. Yeah. yeah. He's... The the most recent number I heard from one of his talks is zero point yeah, seven nine uh, uh, replacement rate. Yeah, entirely. Holy possible. shit! Because China went <laughs> so, so. China had the uh, first of all the industrialization effects that we talked about, right? Which is urbanization. Uh, you have fewer kids when you live in the condo versus on the countryside, and that ha has led to the same phenomenon as everywhere else: people getting older, living longer, and that makes it made it look as though the population was growing in a healthy manner. But then. They had the one-child policy, so they not only did the in, the natural effects of industrialization hit them, but they chose to intentionally to murder, yeah, <laughs> the next generation, triple their population size. 
And so now China, I don't know when the last census was supposed to be done, but Peter Zehan talks about how the Chinese government rejected the last census because they couldn't believe what they saw. They may have overestimated by 100 million. A hundred million at least at, at this point. Yeah. And so Peter Zehan says that within the next 20 years or so, he can see China's population dropping to somewhere in the 500 millions. More than so. half gone. More, yeah. And let's talk a few, about a few other things about China. Because I, I mean, yeah. like when I say bleak, get, get ready for this. So in this world order, of um, that that's about to collapse. China is completely dependent on exporting stuff, exporting stuff to, to bring money, and importing food and importing oil. One of the things so Russia has has going for it, like Nima said, is they got enough food and oil to export it. China doesn't have that. Yeah. They need to import food. China they need doesn't. to import oil. And fertilizer is such a huge deal over there because um, Peter Zahan pointed this out. They don't really have soil yeah. like the way that we have soil. Yeah. So without yeah. fertilizer, yeah. they really can't grow enough food. And because of the, the whole global supply chain cracking, if they don't have food and or if, if the food and oil slows down, their whole system starts to collapse. And furthermore, they don't have any naval projection. This blew my mind. As Peter Zahan pointed out, is that the the in in optimal conditions, China has about fifteen hundred miles of naval projection. And he said that's assuming nobody's shooting at them. If he said if somebody's shooting at them, they probably got about three hundred and fifty miles. And their aircraft carriers, they have two. One used to be a cruise ship. And the other one was modeled off the one that used to be a cruise ship. Like, it, it, it's a joke compared to what the United States has. And so... Yeah, that's why he also doesn't think they're going to attack Taiwan for well, that reason. Well, well, for other reasons as well, but yes, that. Um, so as these global networks are, are, are crumbling, they don't have... Uh, uh, global... Um, What's the word I want? Distribution networks are crumbling. They don't have the naval capacity to enforce them happening, and they are completely dependent on them, both on their imports because they need that for the stuff to live, and both on their exports because they need that for the damn money. And that now that um, uh, the U.S. in particular is bringing the industry home and and pulling it out of China, th- they're on this tipping point. Now add that what into that one more thing that G. I don't. I don't know if he has this in the book yet because th- this is this is a little more um, recent. Is that apparently Xi, according to Peter Zahan, has acquired more power and more cult of personality than Mao Zedong? I have a hard, I have a hard time understanding or believing that, but I mean the guy knows yeah. better than I do, so I'll I'll take his word for it at the moment. So Xi has so efficiently purged the system, and we just saw him purge uh, the president on on live TV. Uh, um, openly, right? I guess that was that was the person who had supported him in the purges before that. And so, w- what a final cap of power to say, okay, you're the last person I know that knows how to purge anybody within my sphere. You're out. And so, what's happened is that the the Chinese government, the CCP, has split into two factions. The first faction is the Z Zealots that they've completely taken over the the cult of personality of Xi, and they're trying to do what they think Xi wants them to do. And the example that he always gives is like they're decontaminating airplane runways for COVID after an airplane takes on and off. Like, that's that's totally retarded. And the other faction are are the people going... I don't, I don't, I don't want to attract Z's attention because he shoots the messenger if they bring bad news. What, what's this he pulled up? Oh, uh, uh, a, a, I, I can't read the top. Was that a G, G Ping's cult of? Oh, G Ping's cult of personality. There it is on, on Wikipedia. So, um, because if if you do something bad, G shoots you. If you do something good, you made G look bad, so he shoots you. So the entire apparatus. Of, of the people who aren't the zealots um, are afraid to do anything unless specifically told because they're afraid of arousing the ire of Xi. And because Xi, even if he was this brilliant mastermind, he can't, he can't uh, micromanage a billion people. The, w- this means that the administrative capacity of China has suddenly become 
unable to respond to changes on top of all this other crazy shit that's happening. Yeah, um, yeah. exactly. Uh, China has become so um, inert, I guess, because nobody even wants to suggest anything to G. She, because they're just scared about what he'll do to them. Right. If he doesn't like the suggestion. Well, so, it, it, so it's just a lot of people are just playing it safe in the Chinese establishment and they'd rather not approach him with anything. And the things they do do, they just go with what seems to have worked so far. You know, so I, you see, I, I think that may explain these strange uh, lockdowns that they keep doing now. Right, because cause, cause they're trying to do what, what, what they think Xi wants or they're just following the policy that's already there. They're going, hey, I'm not I'm not rocking the boat. Right. And what, what here's this. This was fascinating. Peter Zahan pointed out. So remember those blackouts that got reported in China, like back in spring? Apparently, yeah. Xi didn't learn about them until September when he read about it in a newspaper. Nobody told him because they're too afraid to bring him bad news. That's how fucked up the current administration is. The current administrative capacity is in China. Yeah. So um, Peter Zahan has pointed this out that uh, he's like, yeah, I'm totally not afraid of China becoming a world power. Like they're yeah. they are they are on their way out. It's it's imploding in China. Yeah, his his uh, analysis is pretty solid. I think uh, we have some new comments. Um, that was my point. Now add Germany dependency on Russia gas, Russian gas plus the American build build back better that is supposed to incentivize companies, including foreign green jobs for the future. I believe she is top dog of all Chinese dictators. Technology makes a difference. Yeah, I believe right. that. So the green uh, jobs thing is something that Europe is <laughs> suddenly really concerned about, right? So the America, um, the, the Build Back Better bill, or one of these recent builds, subsidizes American EV co companies or American car companies um, to incentivize EV production. And Euro the European government, the European Commission has a problem with this because they don't do that, I guess, to the extent that the U.S. does. And they're really worried about U.S. car companies now gaining a significant competitive advantage in the, in the European market because of these subsidies. Yeah, so that's what he was, yeah, so he says exactly. So that's what he was referring to, um, which is kind of, I, it, I found it weird. I thought I thought the green thing is the thing we're all supposed to do, and yay, we're going to stop the weather from changing, and all the the efforts in the world are warranted and justified. But when it comes to plain numbers, suddenly they're you know they don't they have a problem with that in Europe, right? And so yes, she is obviously the top of the all Chinese dictators. Yeah. Technology makes well, yeah, he has. Like no Chinese dictator has ever had this kind of technocratic society. So if you're like a psycho who wants to dominate an Asian it's country, a perfect, perfect setup for. Perfect for setup. So I now I mean we, we could go country by country and start breaking stuff down, but I don't, I don't want to go that you know that detail well, I, for the show. I think I these think, four players are the big ones. Well, what will be interesting, I think, is to quickly recap why the U.S. has yes. such advantages against almost everyone else in this new world, in this fragmented, fracturing I, order. I think I could do it pretty quickly. First, yeah. we have a food uh, uh, surplus. We actually export food, and we export seed crop. I, I learned this recently. Met some people down in Oregon. They have a farm. They grow seed crop to sell to Asia because they don't have enough space to grow food and grow seeds for the next year. So we, in the United <laughs> States, we literally grow the seeds for other countries to plant their crops. <laughs> the United States is an agricultural powerhouse, unlike I think unlike any other country right. in the world. The U.S. has so much arable land, it's uh, very unique. Second uniqueness is we have a ton of oil, we got a ton of natural gas, and with the um, shale extraction technology getting better and better, um, that we're, we're getting access to huger and huger uh, oil reserves that are there but that we've never had access to. Third, we're com 
our, our security level is like unreal in the sense that we've got oceans on both sides of us and peaceful neighbors to the north and south. Like, Europe doesn't enjoy that sort of situation, right? Fourth, I didn't recognize this one. We have the Mississippi River. I never yeah. knew how big of a deal the Mississippi River is because I, I'm sure anybody watched this. You've seen a map of like all the tributaries of the Mississippi River. It covers like two thirds of the freaking country, right? Almost the entire thing is navigable. Like the Nile's not like that. The Amazon's not like that. The uh, um, the uh, other massive rivers of the world, they don't have that same level of na- navigability. Like, you know, at some point there's some huge waterfall or something like, I, I can't get up that. So um, if you compare um, water transport to ground transport, presuming the roads, the roads and infrastructure are already in place for the trucks, water is one thirteenth the price of ground. And the United States is in a unique position where two thirds of the country is accessible by waterways. No other country on earth has that. Yeah. Yeah. So he talks a lot about the strategic advantages, the economic advantages you have by having a large river network in your country. This is part of his analysis This is part of yes. his um, observations process. And then if you add on to that, the, the, the demographics where we, we essentially, there, there's a couple countries like us, like New Zealand, but we essentially have the best demographics over every other country on earth. Yes. In terms of the, and, re- the replacement population that's going to replace the boomers. Another thing I found interesting is he t- he says that the U.S. has actually been pretty um, moderate in its pace of industrialization compared to all the other countries, compared to especially the early industrializers, uh, Great Britain, and then even Germany afterwards. They rammed it through, but the U.S. countryside wasn't even industrialized up until 1960. So the U.S., this is a pattern and this is a common thing in the U.S. where for, for a long period, things don't really happen. And then suddenly we catch up, mm-hmm. but we take our time. We don't let the trend of the world dominate our industrialization the way it has happened in other countries. And that may have also helped the demographics to some extent adjust to this change. But then obviously, yes, we had the... Uh, we were the last man standing after World War II, and that has allowed the boomers in the U.S. to have a uh, to, to have lots of children, and that's why the U.S. has the largest millennial population in the world, uh, if I understand that correctly. Um, so I can I'll just go through what he lists here in the book. The, sure. The American, uh, the, where Americans have an edge. Number one, geography. You're, like you already said, the United States has a more high quality temperate zone arable farmland than any other country. Uh, the U.S. has more land suitable for habitation. Um, and then, like you said, moving things around on water costs one twelfth of their moving them on land. So that uh, is an advantage in, the, in terms of the geography. Uh, friendly neighbors to the north and to the south. Um, um, and, and obviously, especially what what I thought was interesting, he talks about uh, Mexico. Yes, and, you know the American conservatives' favorite pastime uh, is complaining about what's going on at the southern border. Oh my God, we don't have a country because they can just walk in here. Look at them; they're just what, what kind of country is that? But he says. The southern border is absolutely not a threat to the United States, militarily, geostrategically. It's actually a a super secure border. And he said the fact that people can just, in a disorganized fashion, run through it here or there, that's a testament to how hard it is to organize any kind of governmental action in that, or any kind of governmental activity in that area. Um, so for military to, to march through the desert and mountains and make it into the U.S. intact and uh, to be any kind of danger, he says it's impossible militarily. It's not going to happen. And he also says that the Trump administration's efforts to build oh, yeah. a border wall along Mexico has actually, 
yeah, has expanded the, the network of roads around the border wall, which actually made it easier. So once they get across the border, there's a road that they could just walk on to, to get in. Maybe it froze up. Two, the boomers and the millennials, as we just said, the U.S. has more boomers and millennials. Uh, sorry, the boomers had more children, so we have more millennials uh, in the workforce than any other country, which is uh, mentions as well. They are very different. They're not exactly team workers, so it remains to be seen where the, the Zoomers fall in here. And then part three, the American culture. Um, America is a settler state. The whole country speaks one language, and America doesn't have a hard time integrating people because that's what that's what the country doing, yes. is used to. Um, so, so the U.S. government was expressly not designed to serve the interest of any specific ethnicity. Even adherents of critical race theory fully admit that the politically and economically dominant group in the United States, white Caucasians, are themselves a blend of people of English, German, Irish, Italian, French, Polish, Scottish, Dutch, Norwegian, Swedish, and Russian descent in that order. Then, number four, he says Mexico. You know, while everyone all over the world is going to have problems sourcing cheap labor and cheap goods from somewhere, we we're Mexico. not going to have that problem because we have Mexico. Basically, we're so. going to be able to replace China with Mexico. Yes. And it's going to be cheaper because it's right there. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. exactly. It's ridiculous. And, um, yeah, so that this, these are the big four uh, items that he brings up. Uh, but, but, yeah, definitely um, that's going to be an advantage for, to the United States to, to have Mexico uh, right, right down there. Um, we got another question here, but, Nima, I do have another call I got to jump on here. Uh, yeah. And I'll read the questions. Opinion on the BRICS, which is getting bigger by the day? With Argentina, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman seems to be pivoting Russia. That is a very complex question that uh, will t- <laughs> uh, if we dive into that, we're we're going to be here for Stay a while. Tuned. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, great question. So um, I guess just trying to tie, we we started off with Carol Quigley kind of, kind of laying some groundwork and we say, okay, here's this Peter Zahan guy who – who he, he's not he's not speaking the specific language that that Quigley comes up with, but we really he see him answering similar questions, where we say, okay, um, I think he's described very well this this question mark that Carol Quigley leaves on what's going on after World War II, and then we've got a very specific situation of that's about to crumble, and right. we're not so entirely sure what we're going to hmm. get out of it, but things in general look good for the United States. Right. So then what about the bricks, which are getting bigger and all this? Um, that remains to be seen. But as an American, if you live in the U.S., I think the most interesting takeaway is the reindustrialization and the dominant uh, position that the U.S. is going to be in from here on. And the population growth, by the way, that's going to happen in the U.S. And the population decline in all the other countries. I think it's hard to imagine right now what an incredibly advantageous position the United States is going to find itself in over the next 10 to 20 years. Right, and especially compared to, I mean... I mean, actually, literally over the next 10 years, starting now. And then comparing that to literally, like, all all these places, say, in Africa or, or, or some part of Indonesia or... Something right, where all these places have in, have experienced incredible population growth because they've had access to this free trade network that's been safeguarded by the United States worldwide. If that suddenly gets shut off and they're not able to exchange their one raw one or two raw resources for the um, industrialized goods and products of the world, suddenly they don't have the ability to support that population base anymore. I mean, in a lot of places, it's looking bad. It looks yeah, really, yeah. really bad, but not here. Well, well, and you, so he asked, he asked about BRICS, right? So what's part of BRICS? One part of BRICS is China, right? We so already talked about that. just covered yeah. China. It's going to be really bad. China's going to be looking really bad. I think the S in BRICS is for South Africa, so I don't know. What I don't know. South if, Africa I, I, I can't the I is South for Africa. India. Uh, India, we yeah. can say something, I, but we'll, we'll dive into another conversation. We should have, we'll, just, right. we'll just plan on having a round two on this, Nima. 
Right. And then Russia, we did mention Russia. So we actually covered quite a few of those countries. Um, and a lot of them are going to be experiencing not just economic decline, but population decline. I mean, they are going to literally decline in relevance around you're not going to hear much anymore from some of these countries probably right. at one point because they're just not as relevant as they are at the moment in terms of population size right cool well let's cut let's cut it there um this has been dylan moore and nima majeur of irita tv um you could find us at irita.tv just stick a dot right there in between those two words and follow us at the social media of your choice tell your friends and thanks for watching we'll see you next time <laughs>